Once you start CPR, you want to really make it count because patients are much more likely to survive if you perform high quality CPR than if you perform poor quality CPR. And there are five major determinants of CPR quality, which we're going to discuss in some detail. The first is the rate of compressions. 100 to 120 is the rate that every rescuer should be aiming for. Two is adequate compression depth. We want to go about two to two and a half inches or four to five centimeters. Three is continuity. You should be performing CPR for a minimum of 60% of your total resuscitation time, if not more. Fourth is chest wall recoil. That's diastole in cardiac arrest, and that's what allows the heart to refill. So we want to make sure that we allow the chest to recoil so the heart can fill normally, making each compression count. And last is hyperventilation. Hyperinflating the lungs decreases cardiac output and is another um, variable that produces adverse outcomes in cardiac arrest. So let's start with compression rate. There have been a number of studies looking at rate, and this is one example. Um, in this study, they looked at the mean rate of chest compressions among a large sample of cardiac arrest patients, and they found that the patients who had compressions at a rate of roughly 100 to 120 had the highest probability of ROSCI, which stands for Return of Spontaneous Circulation, and they also had the highest probability of survival to hospital discharge or having a longer term positive outcome. So 100 to 120 is the rate you want to go for. And there's actual science showing us that patients are more likely to survive when we use that rate. Compression depth, we have a similar study looking at depth as an isolated variable. Again, for uh, patients uh, getting return of spontaneous circulation back, the optimal compression depth was just under five centimeters. And same thing for survival to hospital discharge. The optimal compression depth was just a little bit over five centimeters. And what they found in general is that any compression depth, depth over about four centimeters or 38 millimeters produced an odds ratio of 1.91 of survival to hospital discharge, meaning that if you have compressions of greater than 38 millimeters across the board, you're twice as likely to survive. So it's a really important variable and a really easy one to optimize. This graph is about chest compression fraction. So in this study, they looked at the percentage of time in the overall cardiac arrest that the patient had active chest compressions being performed. And they stratified according to the percentage. So 0 to 20, 20 to 40, 40 to 60, et cetera. And they found, not surprisingly, a linear increase in the likelihood of return of spontaneous circulation as the chest compression fraction increased. So if you spend more time during the code performing CPR, you're going to get a better outcome and a higher probability of survival. This is the same uh, data, but this is actually a survival curve rather than the group stratified data. And once again, chest compression fraction of 0 0.8, 0 0.9, or 80 to 90 percent of the time produce the highest likelihood of return of spontaneous circulation. In another study looking at chest compression fraction, the outcomes were a little bit different. Um, in this study, they found that actually um, a 60 to 80 percent chest compression fraction produced the highest odds ratio of survival to hospital discharge, and that's what the current guideline recommends. So you want to be at a minimum of 60%, ideally closer to the 80% range for your chest compression fraction. The bottom line, though, is you're clearly never going to know numerically what your fraction is during the course of a resuscitation. You just want to make sure that your CPR is as continuous and uninterrupted as you can possibly make it. So chest wall recoil is a physiologically important variable, but there's actually no human studies on it that demonstrate improved survival because it's kind of a difficult phenomenon to study. But basically the idea is if you lean on the chest in between compressions, you're gonna increase the patient's inner thoracic pressure, right? You're smashing down on the chest, so that's gonna raise the inner thoracic pressure. Well, we all know that uh, positive pressure ventilation also raises the inner thoracic pressure. Um, so if you cram more air into the lungs, you're going to raise the thoracic pressure. And the bottom line, what brings blood back into the heart during diastole? 
it's negative interthoracic pressure, right? It's that negative pressure gradient that pulls blood from the periphery back up to the heart. So if you raise the interthoracic pressure and make it not negative, you're gonna prevent the heart from filling and you're gonna decrease your cardiac output by decreasing your stroke volume. The ultimate effect, again, is gonna be impaired cardiac output and that means less blood flow to the heart itself, less blood flow to the brain, and less likelihood of spontaneous circulation. So bottom line, high quality CPR is what you need to do to optimize your chances of survival. And the determinants, once again, are push hard, four to five centimeters, push fast, 100 to 120 compressions per minute, keep it going. You wanna make sure your chest compression fraction is a minimum of 60%, if not more, during the course of the arrest, and avoid hyperventilation and chest wall leaning. If you do those five things, you're gonna increase your patient's odds of survival. So, once you have really good quality CPR going, What's the next question you need to answer? You've already decided your patient is pulseless. You've already initiated compressions. What do you need to know now? The answer is, of course, what is the cardiac rhythm? And specifically, is it a rhythm that we can treat with electricity? Is it a shockable rhythm? So shockable rhythms, like we said before, are more likely to survive. Patients who can be shocked are more likely to live through a cardiac arrest, but Defibrillation is a very time-sensitive intervention, meaning the faster you do it, the more likely it is that your patient's gonna benefit from it. So for shockable rhythms, we consider defibrillation to be more important than anything else you can do. More important than uh, CPR, more important than ventilation, more important than drugs or IV access. It is the single most important thing that you can do. So if you have a shockable rhythm, you need to know early and you need to treat it early. Here's one of our shockable rhythms. This is ventricular fibrillation. It's very easy to identify. Um, it's randomly fluctuating. It goes up and down. There's no pattern. There's no rhyme and reason. There's no QRS complexes. It's just a disorganized squiggle. The second one is ventricular tachycardia. Now in VTAC, there actually is organization to the QRS complexes, but they're wide and bizarre looking. So anytime you have a fast rhythm with wide QRX complexes, you should suspect that to be ventricular tachycardia. And by the way, these are the two rhythms that the automated defibrillators that you see in public places are looking for when they determine whether or not a patient should be shocked in cardiac arrest. So, why do we only shock VFib and VTAC? This frustrates a lot of students because you see on TV, everybody in cardiac arrest gets shocked and they all jump up and come right back to life, right? Well, it doesn't work that way in the real world because the whole goal of using electricity is to reorganize a rhythm that is disorganized. Now, when you are in a non-shockable rhythm like PEA, you have some major problems on the table, but electrical disorganization is not one of them. It's not an issue for patients in non-shockable rhythms. And at best, if you go and shock a non-shockable rhythm, nothing will happen. At worst, you could potentially hit the patient at the wrong point in the cardiac cycle, cause an R on T phenomenon, and ultimately precipitate a dysrhythmia like ventricular fibrillation. So the last thing you wanna do in a cardiac arrest is take somebody who has a normal rhythm and turn it into V-fib. That's clearly not benefiting anybody. So we don't perform defibrillation for any rhythm except our two shockable rhythms, V-fib and VTAC. I mentioned before that defibrillation is a time-sensitive intervention, and this graph clearly shows why. So as you can see, the more time that elapses as we move along the axis there, the lower the likelihood of survival for the patient. So for patients in shockable rhythms who are getting shocked within the first minute, you can see 35, 40% of those patients are surviving. But the, by the time we get out to six minutes, it's less than 20% of the patients surviving. So we really wanna make sure that as soon as we're humanly able to do so, we assess the rhythm and we defibrillate if we identify a shockable rhythm. Again, short time to defibrillation, high likelihood of survival. And as we go down to two, three, four, five, six, and more than six minutes, 
you can see that the odds ratio or the likelihood that the patient is going to survive the event goes down consistently with every minute that passes. It's really key to do this quickly. All right. Now, once you've gotten your high quality CPR going and you've assessed your rhythm and defibrillated if it's indicated, what do you want to do next? Well, this is when you can start thinking about respiratory support for your patient. So you can initiate bag valve ventilation in order to give your patient some oxygenation. You want to also coordinate your chest compressions with your breathing. So you're going to do 30 compressions followed by two breaths, 30 compressions followed by two breaths. You also, if you're in a hospital setting, are going to establish vascular access, and you're going to continue reassessing the rhythm every five cycles or two minutes for the duration of the resuscitation. Now, a lot of students ask me, Dr. Young, this is all great, but this is like basic, basic stuff, right? What about the cool stuff like putting in airways and pushing drugs? Well, unfortunately, advanced interventions in cardiac arrest don't really make much of a difference. This is a study that came out of Scandinavia that really showed whether you're performing basic life support or advanced life support, your outcomes are very similar. So in these two cases, you can see the red line represents patients who got no IV access, no IV drugs, and no advanced airway interventions. And the green line represents patients that did receive those interventions. And you can see how very similar the outcomes for both groups were. So bottom line is that CPR and defibrillation is by far the most important um, element of your resuscitation. And all the advanced stuff really doesn't make as much of a difference as we'd like. So let's get back to our case. So we have our 58-year-old guy who collapsed at a sporting event. What are we going to do for him? Well, like we already said, one, we're going to call for help as quickly as we can. Two, we're going to think CAB, so we're going to go to him and we're going to decide whether or not he's got a carotid pulse. If he doesn't, we're going to go ahead and initiate chest compressions. And then once we can get access to a defibrillator, which hopefully at a sporting event would be pretty quickly, we're going to put it on, assess the rhythm, and defibrillate if, of course, it's indicated. Mm -hmm.